Hello everybody and welcome to the J72 Gaming Channel. My name is Jacob, but you can just call me Jay here. Path of Titans has updated and with it, we now have access to the new map of Gondwa, an incredible island with tons of different and unique biomes such as swamplands, rocky mountains, salt flats, savannas, and even a burned down forest as a result of a nearby volcano. So in today's video, I wanted to give you an all-in-one spot to see everything Gondwa has to offer. Your ultimate tour and guide to Gondwa. We'll make sure to see each and every one of the 29 different areas here on this island. What each of them have to offer aesthetically, and I'll make sure that you have a full understanding of how to get around here in our new prehistoric playground. If this video helps you at all, consider liking it to help boost it in the algorithm so others can find it as well. And if you like what you see here, I'd love to have you join the Sauropod Squad here on this channel by subscribing down below. But with that, everybody, make sure you sit back, kick back, and grab a snack as I take you on an adventure through this prehistoric land. Welcome, everybody, to the map of Gondwa. Now, we're going to be using this often in today's video, so I want to place it front and center here for everybody at the start of the video. Feel free to screenshot it as needed. And, of course, full credit goes to my favorite map website for this game, Volnona.com. Gondwa has a lot of different areas, as you can see, but to simplify things for us, I'd like to break it down into four separate zones. The first zone is up at the top of the map, the Northern Zone, which is everything north of the river that runs through Sharptooth Marsh and past the volcano in Desolus Pass. Now also, I thought it would be fun to name the rivers and some other areas throughout this video, since some places don't have names in the game, and they're pretty important to talk about often. The first one is this river, which I think we can safely name the Sharptooth River. The western zone is everything west of the river that runs north and south past the Grand Plains and the Young Grove. And this is another river we need to name, so let's call it the Grand River. The central zone is everything sandwiched between the previously mentioned Grand River and the large, nameless mountain range in the east. So let's simply call this the Gondwa Mountain Range. This leaves the eastern zone of the map to include everything that remains east of the Gondwa mountain range. So now that we have broken down some of the zone borders, let's focus on each one and help you all get a grand overview of each area. We'll work our way from north to west to central and ending in the east. Also, everyone say hello to my Thalassodromius, Scout. He's going to be helping us get all these shots today by being our, literally, our eyes in the sky. I also want to mention that I won't be discussing the aquatic zones and many of their islands in much detail today, since that would likely double the length of this video. Uh, but let me know if you guys want to see another guide for the waterways of Gondwa. Alright, let's get into some details and epic flyby shots. Cue the music. Welcome everybody to the Northern Zone, an area defined by rugged mountains, colorful rocks, and seemingly dormant volcanoes. This volcano also needs a name, and since I and so many others have used this map website for multiple dinosaur games, I hope we can all start calling this Mount Volnona. Plus, that just kind of sounds like a cool name for a volcano, okay? <laughs> For starters, most of Mount Volnona is placed in the Desolate Pass, an area littered with rocks along the ridgelines. This arid pass hosts a lot of seemingly young trees, and if you ask me, it looks a lot like an area that was severely damaged when the last eruption happened, and it's only had a few decades to recover. 
This area follows the ridgeline out from the volcano and has a nice Rocky Mountain vibe home cave near the ocean. It's a pretty cozy spot out there for sure. So while Desolate Pass surely felt the destruction of the volcano in the past, there is a small zone that is currently flourishing because of it. Tucked away north of Mount Vonona Summit is the Hot Springs. Now there are a few hot springs in Gondwa, but this one is by far and beyond the most grand of them all. Tucked between the young trees shared by the nearby pass are pockets of extremely hot bodies of water, each one bubbling and cultivating rich nutrients and microorganisms. Curiously enough, if you drink this water, you will actually gain a healing buff for a short time. <laughs> now, now don't ask me how it works, I just know that Scout absolutely loves it. The volcano, however, seems to have had an even more recent victim than Desolate Pass, because just east of Mount Volnona's crater is the Burn Forest, and as the name implies, is a dry, burnt, and struggling forest. The cooled down lava flow that caused so much of this destruction can still be seen, seemingly frozen in time as it poured out of the summit crater. This zone is honestly one of my favorites in Ganwa, and is easily my favorite pick here in the northern zone. The atmosphere, it's, it's eerie, it's lonely, dry, and just gives off a feeling of despair. I'm honestly really impressed with the different vibes that they were able to pull off here in Gondwa, and this is one of the first places that really made me kind of sit back and appreciate the significant upgrade from our previous map of Panjura. <laughs> Flying back west to the coast, it's time to start saying goodbye to our Mount Vilnona, but out here its impacts are still felt. The savanna grasslands is still a very arid environment due to its proximity to Mount Vilnona, but out here life is able to thrive. Termite mounds are plentiful in this location, an absolute smorgasbord for any insect-eating creatures roaming Gondwa. I may know a certain Struthiomimus that would love to speed his way around the savanna grasslands. <laughs> there are also a few berry bushes here, so overall this is not a bad place for herbivores to set up shop, and a short trip over to the hot springs could be all they need to top up on fresh water. So if you're looking for an African safari trip out on Ganwa, look no further than here. Alright, welcome to Hunter's Thicket, the area that takes up the grand majority of the northern zone. And honestly, it could be three distinct different areas all in their own right. The main two points of interest that dominate the landscape here, however, are the two large rock formations of Hunter's Thicket's home cave and the nearby waystone of Snake Gully, which we will get to shortly. Both of these rocky summits tower above a vast and elaborate canyon pass that winds its way under dense plateaus of mountain pines. Nestled quietly up on one of these large plateaus is a large, singular hot spring that does indeed heal the dinosaur that drinks from its shores. South of the home cave summit, we have a large lake, one of the biggest in Gondwa, actually, and easily the largest supply of fresh water for all the areas in the northern zone. The rivers that flow in and out of these lakes also need names, and since we are about to talk about the next zone, we might as well call this the Snake River and the Snake Lake, because just north along the river is the small valley of Snake Gully. Snake Gully is an open field with only a few oak trees, which is a stark contrast to the pine tree so abundant in the hunter's thicket. The field brings a nice break in the landscape and can provide dinosaurs here an ample eyesight on everything around them, be it for predators or maybe for prey. Let's take a journey now up and over the canyons of hunter thickets to arrive at the northern coast of Gondwana. The rocky cliffs of the thicket almost seemingly try to continue westward into the ocean here in the mudflats, as they disperse and steadily get less prevalent in this coastland landscape. The mudflats are a small and damp little area of Gondwa, as you would expect a tidal zone to be. Tide pools full of starfish, clams, sea snails, and other creatures call this their home. And while there is no fresh water, berry bushes, nor meat to be found here, it could be a nice, quiet time for a quest or two on the beach. Let's continue up the coast now, shall we? Here we have our next area, Rockfall Hill. And like the name implies, is mainly one large hill sloping down towards the coast on the northern side of Gondwa. 
Rocks are abundant here, which you might have assumed correctly as well. <laughs> but the environment here is dry and arid, similar to the savanna grasslands, yet thriving with what seems to be tall and skinny acacia-like trees. The beachside here also has a plethora of fallen rocks that have seemed to tumble their way down the hill. Honestly, Rockfall Hill may be the most accurately named location so far on this list. Okay, another extremely interesting area with a surprising amount of accuracy to its name. Welcome to Rainbow Hills. This location is super unique within Gondwa. I mean, just look at it. Reds, oranges, pinks and purples, even greens and blues color the landscape of Rainbow Hills. Someone definitely dialed up the color hue slider here to 11 out of 10. Besides the paint palette of color being splashed everywhere in the area, it also continues the dry and arid climate many of these northern zone areas have had. Only a few trees managed to grow out here, and there's absolutely no fresh water here besides the Snake River to the west. And lack of fresh water is going to continue as we head into our last three small areas of the northern zone. Alright, let's group the last three spots here together for this one. Flyers Bluff, The Teeth, and ocean pillars. Along with Rainbow Hills, the pillars and bluff all border the intimidatingly named and even more intimidating looking Teeth Bay. While Flyers Bluff is a simple raised island where, get this, only flyers will be able to reach, <laughs> the teeth is anything but simple. From shore, the teeth look like simple rocks protruding from the ocean below, but it's when you dive beneath the surface when things start looking ominous. These teeth are four separate craters of rocks, almost sinkholes, and these things go deep. Now, it's not a place full of food or quests, but it's definitely one of the more interesting locations here on our Gondor tour, which made it worth mentioning even though it is an ocean location. Now, back up on the surface of the water, we have the Ocean Pillars, a very small zone but full of beautiful pillars of white salt-lined rocks. This place, while tiny, does have a good host of some quests here, and is generally a quiet spot amongst the chaos that can be the Northern Zone. Alright, let's move on to another zone here in Gondwa, the Western Zone, an area defined by its mountain range, expansive open plains, and what is quite possibly the most popular spot on the entire map. But before we get to this most popular spot on the map, let's talk about the salty, swampy, sharp tooth marsh. I really enjoy this zone, and it's a dramatic upgrade from the marshes and swamps of the previous map we had, Pandura. Here we have a marsh that has plenty of deep water to swim through, plentiful islands for subaquatics to take a break on and bask in the sun, and all of the foliage of the area just gives off a, an aroma almost. You can really tell that this place is stinky and it's a damp marshland. And I love that the developers were able to pull off such an atmospheric change here compared to the rest of the map. Now in the old map of Pandura, there was a very noteworthy place called Corpse Cove. And it was the spot everybody went to hang out, congregate, or look for a fight. And in Gondwa, we still have a location just like that. Everybody, if you didn't already know about it from first-hand experience, then I welcome you to the Impact Crater. While simultaneously being a cool dinosaur reference, this crater has everything you would need for a tiny battle arena. The lake in the middle makes for a source of fresh water and is worth fighting over, all while having sloped hills around you for clear visibility and a severe lack of trees for cover. There are even some berry bushes and a down corpse for meat, so this spot literally has everything you would need to survive in. So if you're able to claim it as your spot, you're going to be happy. Impact, Crater, Battle Royale fights are bound to be a popular site here. Now, just east of the Impact Crater is one of the largest areas we have in Gondwa, the Grand Plains. 
featuring everything you would imagine from a serene location with glorious hills rolling as far as the eye can see. Flowers and lush grass are plentiful out here, as you might expect, and yet the area still manages to surprise me. You see, tucked away on the north side of these majestic plains is a large and complex cave system, a safe reserve away from the hunting eyes of predators who are surely using the high visibility of the plains to their advantage. This is going to be another amazing location for nesting once the, that arrives to the game. There are, however, as you may have assumed, many, many berry bushes out in the plains. So, while visibility may be extremely high here, there is abundant food, and even a few hideaways for growing herbivores. Towering high above the Grand Plains, we have Wilderness Peak, our next destination and the one that truly encapsulates the vibe of the Western Zone. Wilderness Peak is tall, huge even. And while there are other summits in the game like Fulnona Volcano or the upcoming Gondwa Mountain between the Central and Eastern Zones, Wilderness Peak to me feels the most mountainous. Rocky switchback pathways line the way up to the summit here, and the place does include quests, which can be easy or hard, depending on the type of creature trying to survive here. Flying creatures or fast ones that can scurry up and down rock faces will thrive here. But large lumbering apex creatures, well, they may find the cliffs a bit difficult. North of Wilderness Peak and tucked between the impact crater and the sea, we have one of the most regal of locations, the White Cliffs. Similar to Rock Hill Fall of the Northern Zone, this location is one large rolling hill. Scaling down from the heights of Wilderness Peak onward to the shores below, this area is defined by the, <laughs> are you shocked at this point? The namesake of the location, the bright white rocks that line the area. Sharp cliffs border the hills of this area, making getting up and down and around sometimes difficult. Yet off in the west is a special noteworthy lake of fresh water up above the salty ocean seas below. Oh yeah, it's also got a home cave included. Next up we have one of, and if I may speak freely here, one of the most beautiful areas we have visited yet. Here we have an area split into two sections. Up above, tucked next to the cliffs of Wilderness Peak, we have two large and rather cozy fresh water lakes. These lakes flow west towards the sea, and as they do, we are treated with the Triad Falls themselves, a rocky and jagged collection of waterfalls that pour from the lakes above into the, what I'm gonna be calling the Triad Bay below. This first section of Triad Falls is what the area is named for, but the rest of the area is defined by a dense pine forest, thick with berry bushes and other foliage for creatures to enjoy. The density here is one of the thickest forests we have in Gondwa, only rivaled by the dark woods, which we will soon visit in the central zone. The remoteness out here in the far west may also provide a nice, quiet, and beautiful location for you to explore. I highly recommend the south shore during sunset. Peak Gondwa views. It's almost as if our next area is envious of Triad Falls, because the Young Grove seems to be trying to live up to its larger and denser forest neighbor. Young Grove is an easy extension to Triad Falls, having the same type of trees, yet less dense. The grove, however, can be set unique by the plentiful rock caves that scatter their way across the area. Due to this, mushrooms are easily found here under the rocks, and quests can also be easily accomplished. Thus, the young in the grove name is a good invitation for the young creatures of Gondwa to come and stay a while, all to grow up and head off to larger areas in the world. All right, folks, we're just over halfway on our tour of Gondwa today. I hope you've all been enjoying it. Next up is the smallest zone, but is one that is connected to all the others, and within it are some of the largest areas we've seen so far. The Central Zone. This area is mainly defined by the many rivers that flow through and along it, as well as the ever-looming shadow of that massive mountain we decided to call the Gondwa Mountain Range. 
Let's head back to the Young Grove and continue down the coast for a while. The first area up, just across the Grand River, is Dark Woods. These woods look to the Young Grove and the Triad Falls and laughs, because this, my friends, is the darkest, densest forest Gondwa has to offer. And being here at night will truly test your fear of the dark. But Dark Woods is more than just a simple dark forest. This area has its own mountain, which, while small in overall size, its height actually rivals that of Wilderness Peak and the Gondwa Summit. Plus, in the rocks below the peaks of, let's call this mountain, the Dark Mountain. Down below the peaks of the Dark Mountain, there is a secret cave system, big enough to have its own dense little forest down here as well. The area has a lot of places to hide, so if you can face your fears here, it could provide you with the shelter you need. Continuing down the beach, we have the Whistling Columns. Now, I have a question for you all here, because me and Scout, we can't figure it out. This area is defined by two spots that could be the Whistling Columns. Along the beach here, you can see the many protruding rock columns we have in front of us, so surely those are the columns here that we're talking about. Whistling from the wind off the ocean breeze. However, just up the hill from the shore is a hot spring caldera. So, of course, the whistling sounds of geysers spraying hot water columns is where this area should get its name. Now, there currently aren't any animations for geysers here right now, nor do the columns down at the beach actually make whistling sounds. <laughs> so I'll leave it up to you to decide the real reason behind the name of whistling columns. For the next area, we return back north to the Titan's Pass, smack dab in the middle the heart of Gondwa, a fitting and suitable place for the game Path of Titans to place its path for Titans. This high altitude complex is going to be a true challenge for anybody to traverse through. I like to think of this place as the Apex's playground. In the center of the map, it's high up, and you can see it's high reaching rocks, let's call these the Titan rocks, from most areas of the map. And with the names Titans Pass, it's a challenge to all of those who see themselves as worthy of crossing through. So, viewers, I ask you, are you willing to test yourself in a path meant for Titans? Well, if you're not so keen on the adventure awaiting in the Titans Pass, there's always the area just to its north. Green Hills is very similar to Titans Pass, just, well, a bit more green, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Smaller canyons and some less steep hills will allow you to practice surviving out here in Gondwa. Now, both areas do share this beautiful lake between the two of them, and the high alpine climate up here is sure to make the drink cold and refreshing. Green Hills is also home to the Central Zone's Waystone, so if you need to group up here, this place could be a good starting point for new creatures to begin their adventure. The east side of the central zone has our last area to explore in this zone. Here we have Big Quill Lake, which I wasn't too sure which zone to put it in as it technically is a bit east of the Gondwa mountain range. But since its rivers flow south into the green hills and eventually Titans Pass and Whistling Columns, it feels much more connected to the central zone than anywhere else. Now the lake itself has a massive island in the center and let's call this Quill Island, I guess. <laughs> it's a small area on the map overall, but is frequented often as this is one of the only few freshwater locations close to the very dry neighboring areas. So know that if you choose to check this place out, you likely won't be doing it alone. All right, folks, we have made it all the way to our final zone of Gondwa to see today. I hope you're all still enjoying this adventure. This next zone has some of the most eccentric areas we've seen so far, and the entire zone has a dry and dusty feeling, with the exception of a particularly popular valley. But first and foremost, let's talk about the elephant in the room, or rather, the stego in the mountain. 
Stego Mountain is easily the most unique location on the entire map. Sure, I may have said so about the nature or fauna of areas like the savanna grassland or the burnt forest, or even the uniqueness of the rocks like in Rainbow Hills and the White Cliffs, but Stego Mountain is in a whole nother ballpark. The creators of this map sure had a fun time making this mountain range, and they have done an absolutely fantastic job at personifying a ton of rocks and trees to look like a Stegosaurus. It's, it's honestly so cool. <laughs> Stego Mountain is the main viewpoint here in the Eastern Zone, and you can literally see it from everywhere else we are about to discuss. It's iconic and easily the most photogenic location here in Gondwa. While it won't have any water for you to drink from, a trend which you will notice here in the East like I mentioned, the questing here is solid. If you can manage one or two while passing through, it's well worth the visit. And plus, then you can bask under the island's true titan. North of Big Quill Lake, we have what may actually be the driest area here in Gondwa, the Salt Flats. This area is small overall, but it's big enough to be home to this area's waypoint as well. Personally, it's really cool to see the large, expansive Salt Flats in Gondwa. There's the nature side to it, where it's really neat to see different biomes included here. And I mean, we've seen a few hot springs, forests of all types, rocky cliffs and hills, mountains even, canyons, plains, and swamps but now we have a salt flat to enjoy. But if we were to talk about the game for a second, this is a perfectly flat location here to do whatever type of video gamey thing you want to do. You need a perfect deathmatch arena? Salt flats. Want to test dinosaur speeds against each other in a race? Salt flats. Need an open area to showcase a creature's skin in open sunlight? Salt flats. This is a really handy location to have on the map for the overall type of game Path Titans is, and it's pretty cool at that too. Plus, it's also just a really nice looking salt flat. <laughs> On our last map of Pandora, we had a zone so different, so simply special that I never forgot its name nor its landscape feature. And that was called Hoodoo Hills. It really rolls off the tongue, that one. <laughs> Hoodoo Hills. Well, they must have realized that they had a good thing going, because in Gondwa, we have the Hoodoo Expanse. They thought that, hey, that place was cool, we should expand that idea. And so they did, and they absolutely peppered the area with Hoodoos. The Hoodoos that cover this area are made even more cool when you realize that they actually continue into the nearby ocean in the sunken Hoodoos area. Again, we're not going to go cover the ocean zones here in this video, but the point is that the Hoodoos in Hoodoo Hills were so loved that they made it not only into the next map of Gondwa, but into its oceans as well. <laughs> and yes, I did try to say Hoodoos as many times as possible in this segment. <laughs> Hoodoo. South of the Hoodoos, check it out, I managed to say it once more. <laughs> South is Ripple Beach. Tucked behind Stego Mountain, this beach area is similar to the first visited mudflats way back in the northern zone. Here the beach is lined with plenty of sea creatures and all of their remains. The sands of Ripple Beach are the most extensive that we have here as far as beaches in Gondwa, and they are easily going to be a popular spot for semi-aquatics that want to lounge after feasting on all the plentiful fish off of its coast. Now inland a bit in this area, the biome changes to almost resemble the savanna but it has its own unique take on an arid prairie. As we travel south here to our last few areas, we will notice a dramatic difference in the availability of water. All of the areas we have discussed so far within the eastern zone have been void of fresh water, a truly dry and arid region that makes the northern zone's volcano's destruction look like a soaked sponge in comparison. Well, Broken Tooth Canyon is no different. This dusty section of a map has a few main canyons that wind along its fragmented forests above. Rock arches are common here, and the area reminds me heavily of real life places like Arizona or Utah. Now to make matters worse with the lack of fresh water, no berries nor food corpses can be found here. So make sure you're well prepared before traveling in this desert. Now the one exception to this dry eastern zone is the Green Valley. But let's save that oasis for last, because first I want to show you the Dried Lake. The Dried Lake is the final destination in this lack of water marathon out here in the Eastern Zone. 
like the Salt Flats, we are gifted with another flat area to play in, where there used to be what I could only assume was a glorious mountainside lake. Well, now it's just dust and bones. The surrounding area of the lake has suffered from the lack of water just as badly, as the features in this dry crater all seem brittle and ready to shatter into dust at the slightest touch. So travelers, if you dare to brave the dried lake, just like the Broken Tooth Canyon, make sure you're prepared with water. All of you may be able to find some food before they crumble away with the passing of time. Okay folks, we've made it. This is our final destination on our journey through Gondwa. I wanted to choose a place that was full of life to end our adventure today. The Green Valley has to be the most fruitful area in terms of survivability. Fish, berries, fresh grass, meat, and most importantly, other dinosaurs. This is truly the promised land for many creatures here on Gondwa. Just know that because of the lack of water in the surrounding areas, that this valley will be no quiet resting spot. Visit here for the water, the food, and even the views. But do so carefully, folks. Because just like the rest of Gondwa, where there are resources, there will be others. And those others will be out to claim for themselves or prove to others that they are the true apex out here on the island. The true titans of Gondwa. All right, everybody, that's it for our guide and tour of Gondwa. I really hope you enjoy this adventure. I put in many hours to make sure you guys got the ultimate guide you'll need. And I hope the food and water maps will help you out on your quests and adventures here in Gondwa. And I hope that you gained at least a little more appreciation for the beautiful map that the developers over at Alderaan Games have given us. From the tops of mountains like Gondwa Summit, Dark Mountain, Volnona Volcano, and Wilderness Peaks, down to the valleys of Broken Tooth Canyon, green hills, and the hunter's thicket, and through the dense trees of dark woods, triad falls, and even the burned forest. This has been your tour of Godwa. I have been your host, tour guide, and hopefully by the end of this, your friend, Jay. If you'd like to stick around for more videos like this here in Godwa, then I welcome you to subscribe to join the Sauropod Squad. But until next time, everybody, no matter if it's morning, afternoon, evening, or night, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Peace out, all.